God bless you today. It is such a joy to be with you this morning and uh, be able to share what God has to say to each and every one of us. We have been taking a look at Jesus' great Sermon on the Mount, and in that powerful message, he calls each and every one of us to live as genuine disciples. True Christianity is not simply a matter of knowing a few truths and then going on with life as usual. True Christianity is supernatural living. It is living empowered by the living God, living that is anchored and founded in the death and resurrection of Jesus, our Savior. It is living that is nurtured and strengthened by the Holy Spirit. It is real living. And today we're going to be taking a look at a very powerful truth that our Lord proclaimed in this sermon. But not just in this sermon. Jesus speaks of this constantly and throughout the scriptures, throughout the gospels, we hear about this powerful desire of God that his will be done. And so today, that's what we're going to be discussing. Before we do, let's pray. Would you join with me, please? Heavenly Father, we come before you this day seeking wisdom from above, understanding from your word, conviction by the Holy Spirit, and joy in our daily living as we seek your will. May the words of Jesus speak directly into each one of our hearts and souls today. May we be changed and transformed by his truth, truth that abides and endures forever. And may each one of us, Lord, be encouraged this day as you speak to us and your Holy Spirit bears testimony through Jesus, our Savior, we pray this. Amen. Well, today we continue to look at the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount about how to pray. He gives us an outline of what real prayer looks like for a disciple. We call it the Lord's Prayer. And today we're going to look at just a few words from Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Here they are. Jesus taught us to pray like this. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, these are radical words. In fact, they're, they're words that are so different from the way we human beings normally pray outside of a relationship with the living God. Our natural impulse is not to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In fact, the way we by nature tend to pray is like this. My will be done and your will be changed. <laughs> My will be done. We want things our way. We want to set our own agenda. We, we want to be in control of our own destinies. And if God's will gets in the way, the normal response of fallen human being, and that's all of us, the normal response is to say, well, Lord, change your will. Do it my way instead. That is not the way of Christ. That is not the way of the Messiah. That's not the way of God. Our God calls us to a totally different attitude. And Jesus speaks of that, not just here in the Sermon on the Mount, but he speaks of it over and again throughout the Gospels. Where I'd like to get started this morning is by taking a look at some words Jesus spoke to people who had seen his divine power. We're going to be looking for a moment at John chapter 6, starting at verse 35. If you'd open your Bibles to that, I, I know many of you have already turned in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Well, let's go to John chapter 6 for a few moments, okay? And, and to set the stage for what we read here, these words of Jesus come just after he has performed one of the most remarkable miracles he ever carried out. It is the only one of Jesus' miracles, other than his resurrection, that is mentioned by all four gospel authors. It is the feeding of the 5,000 with five loaves of bread. And, and by the way, the, the words that are used to describe those loaves of bread, they're, they're basically the size of small pancakes, little barley pancakes, and, and two small fish. With that meager lunch, Jesus fed a crowd of 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. Most likely somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10,000 people fed with five little barley cakes and two fish. When people saw this, they said, this is amazing. This is incredible. This, this is, well, this is a money saver. <laughs> 
And Jesus had to set them right. In fact, the next day he spoke to them. And that's what we read here in John chapter 6, beginning at verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. Jesus is addressing these people who have not only seen his remarkable works, but experienced them firsthand. And he says, you have seen what I've done. You have seen me in the flesh, but you still don't believe. And so he goes on. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus declares very forcefully, he has come to do the Father's will, whatever the cost, whatever the price, and he knows full well what that means, because he knew the cost was the cross, and he knew the price was his own blood. But as he declares, he has not come to do his own will, but to do the Father's will. When Jesus teaches us to pray, your will be done, he is not just giving us orders from above. He is speaking what he himself does. He does the Father's will. And so he goes on, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Now, I just need to state right up front here, if today you are not a follower of Jesus, if you are not yet a Christian, God's will for you begins right here. Verse 40, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. God is calling you, whether you're on the fence or on the outside looking in, He is calling you to come to the Lord Jesus because anyone who comes to Him, He will not turn that person away. He will not turn His back on you, no matter what you've experienced in your life, no matter what you have been through, no matter what your grudges, what your sorrows, what your pain, no matter if you're angry at God for where things are today, God's will for you begins right here. It begins with the Lord Jesus. It begins by saying, Lord, I give myself to you. I believe you. I will follow you. I believe what you say because you have the words of eternal life. Jesus says, everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him, not some, not most, not a few, but everyone shall have eternal life and he will raise us up at the last day. You don't want to miss that. <laughs> None of us should. God's will begins right there, that we know the Lord Jesus, that we repent and receive him as our Savior, that we trust him even when we don't fully comprehend, and that we listen to his voice. That's where the will of God begins. And when Jesus teaches you and me to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What he is inviting us to do is to invite God to conquer us. In this, in this petition, we are inviting God to conquer us because by nature, our normal way of doing things is to say, my will be done. But in this prayer, Jesus is calling us to a life of absolute trust in the living God, a life of faith in him. And he is calling you and me to invite God to conquer us. I'll just ask you, have you done that in your life? In your life today, have you invited the Lord to take control? You see, faith is not simply a matter of knowing certain Bible truths. 
Faith is a matter of putting one's trust in the Lord. And that means even if we are fearful, even if we don't understand, even if we are reluctant, we take him at his word and he invites us to simply say, Lord, take charge of my life. When you and I do that, we are acting on faith. We are inviting God to take control. And what he does is he changes us. He transforms us from within. What Jesus is calling us to, to do here is to set aside the old way of doing things and instead do things God's way. And that means that we come before God and we say, I want to want what you want. <laughs> right now, that's my desire, Lord. E even if I don't really want to do what you would have me do. I want to. I want to want what you want. And it's not merely a matter of our mind, but it's also a matter of our actions. How did Jesus teach us to pray? Your will be done. Your will in my mind. I want to know your will. I want to want what you want. And in my actions, I want to do what you would do. I want to do what you would do. I want to listen to Jesus. I want to learn from him what it means to live in a relationship with the Father. I want to learn from him what it means to walk by faith. I want to learn from him what it means to truly be a disciple, a follower of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. In this prayer, we are inviting God to take control. And we ought to be saying, Lord, I want to want what you want and I want to do what you would do. Now, this brings us to the obvious question. And the obvious question is this, how can we know his will? You know, I've been a pastor for more than four decades now. And in that period of time, one of the things that I've seen is that certain questions get asked over and over again. I've spoken to people in their homes. I've spoken to people in hospitals. I've spoken to people in airports and on airplanes. I have spoken to people in their backyards. I've spoken to people in the street. I've spoken to people in their businesses. I've spoken to people in the grocery store. The list goes on and on. And there is a question that I have heard over and again from people of all ages. And the question is this one. How can we know his will? Maybe you're wrestling with something like that right now. Perhaps in your life, you're wondering, well, God, what do you want me to do in this particular situation? How do you want me to proceed? What is your desire for me? How do we know God's will? I believe. I believe from what Jesus taught. I believe from what the Bible reveals. I believe from what the Holy Spirit explains. I believe that you and I can know his will. And here's how. First of all, from his word. You know, the psalmist wrote these words. They're words that I learned as a kid. Psalm 119, verse 105. I learned it in the King James. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. It guides me in the darkness. It shows me where to go. I don't want to be wandering around, stumbling over things. I want clear light. I want clear direction. And the scripture says, God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. That's where we go first to his word. And in all honesty, Something else I've seen repeatedly over the years, over four decades of being a pastor, is that many people want to do it on their own. Many people say, well, I want to go by my gut. I want to go with what my gut tells me. But, you know, sometimes your gut can tell you you ate too much pizza. But you don't want to rely on your gut for things that are of eternal significance. God's word is the defining truth. God's word is what gives direction. You know, it was several months ago, 
a dear friend of mine. In fact, our friendship goes all the way back to when we were in kindergarten, but we didn't see one another after halfway through first grade. And for about 50 years, we were totally out of touch with one another. And then about 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, I was told in a dream to Google my friend. I learned that he is an Orthodox Jewish rabbi and that he lives of all places in Jerusalem. We got reacquainted and it's been a tremendous blessing. Several months ago, he sent me an email suggesting I pick up a couple of books. What I found interesting is both of those books were on my want list. But when my friend said that, I thought I'm going to get them right away. I ordered them, picked them up and uh, started reading. Among the two books was this one written by Dennis Prager. It's a commentary on Exodus. This past week, I started reading this. I had already been reading the other book, but I picked this one up this week. And this is what I came across, and it speaks directly to what we're talking about here. How can we know his will? Well, it's through the word. This is what it says. We live in an age that not only has little wisdom, it doesn't even have many people who value it. People greatly value knowledge and intelligence, but not wisdom. And the lack of wisdom, certainly in America, and the rest of the West is directly related to the decline in biblical literacy. In the American past, virtually every home, no matter how poor, owned a Bible. It was the primary vehicle by which parents passed wisdom on to their children. In the modern period, however, people have increasingly replaced Bible-based homes and Bible-based schools with godless homes and with schools in which the Bible is never referred to. As a result, we are less wise and more morally confused. Now, Dennis Prager, like my friend, is Jewish, but he's right on with this. <laughs> he is right on. Today, there are many people who are so confused about what to do, what God wills. And the reason is they've wandered from the word. Again, 40 plus years as a pastor, I've heard from many people who say, I wish I knew what God's will was. But when you talk a little further and find out what their practice is in life, the Bible is an unread book. And that goes for many people who call themselves believers, who define themselves as Christian. Our God is speaking to us through his word. And if we are truly going to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we need to know what that will is. And that will is described, proclaimed, recorded, set forth in the pages of scripture. It's why the apostle Paul would write to his dear colleague, Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, and he would say to him, all scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you and I are going to know what God desires, it is absolutely essential that we begin in his word. We begin in his word with humility, saying, Lord, teach me. Now, maybe you say, well, you know, Chris, I tried reading the Bible once and it was so difficult. I just gave up on it. Uh, you know, I admit there are some parts of the Bible that are difficult. Uh, but quite honestly, if I may summarize what Mark Twain once said, it's not the, the things I don't understand in the scripture that affect me. It's the things I do understand. And what I do understand is clear that God desires you and me to repent, that he desires us to respond to his love and mercy in Jesus and walk by faith, that he calls us to know and understand his truth and to practice in our lives the truths of his divinely revealed plan, to 
love him above all else, to love others, to walk in the truth, to reject the lies, to live honorably and faithfully and morally, to heed his commandments and to follow his ways. If you want to know God's will, this is where we need to start. It's with his word. There is a second way we come to know God's will. And God's will gets cemented in our hearts, our minds, and our souls. And that is through prayer. Once again, Jesus is very clear in his teaching. Listen to these words from John chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Here's what Jesus said. He spoke these words, by the way, on the last night of his life, before his arrest, his brutal trial, his beating, and his crucifixion, but also before his resurrection. When you know that you are coming to your life's end, you speak about things that really matter. And Jesus, knowing full well that the cross lay before him, spoke about the things that really mattered so that when he was risen, his disciples would remember what he had said. Here's what he said. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now, many people look at that and say, well, is he giving us carte blanche to you know, ask for... Is this God's answer to Visa? This is not Jesus' teaching that we ought to pray, give me. This is Jesus' teaching we ought to pray, guide me. Show me, Lord, lead me. Prayer, prayer is not simply asking God for stuff. Prayer is coming into the presence of God and understanding that a relationship with him is just that. It's a relationship. And I want to spend time in his presence so that I may more and more think his thoughts, know his will, desire what he desires. And I know because Jesus promised it that when I come before him in faith, he hears and he answers, he leads and he guides. Prayer, prayer is not a wish list. Prayer is the opportunity to talk with the God who loves us and allow him to shape and mold our hearts and our minds and our spirits. First John chapter five talks about that very thing. Verses 14 and 15, John, the very one who recorded those earlier words of Jesus writes this. He says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And by the way, if we're praying your will be done, we're going to be asking things according to his will. <laughs> and John goes on, he says, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. We know that God is faithful, that God will deliver. We know that God is going to provide the answer that God is going to lead, that he will guide. He does not leave his children stumbling around in the dark. In his word, he gives us clear definition of his righteous and good and holy will. And as we spend time in his presence in prayer, he brings to us a transformed heart, a changed mind, a realization of the reality of God. And that, that, dear friends, molds us and shapes us in the image of Jesus. It changes us. Which leads us to the third way we can know the will of God. And that is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit guides God's people. The Holy Spirit is the one who not only brings us to faith initially, but who then works inside of us to mold, shape, and change us into new people from the inside out. 
There are two great examples of the way the Spirit of God works in the book of Acts. Well, there are many more than that. And in fact, there are multiple examples throughout the scriptures, but there are two that especially come to mind for me. One of them is Acts chapter 5, verses 29 to 32. The, the setting is the disciples, two of them, Peter and John, have been arrested. And they've been arrested because they're proclaiming Jesus and telling other people that he has risen from the grave, that he is Israel's Messiah, that he is the one who brings forgiveness of sins and life forever. And uh, the religious leaders, they are, they're just, they are torqued. I mean, they, they are beside themselves with anger that these guys would not obey what they had told them to do. We told you to stop preaching in this man's name and declaring in him the resurrection from the dead. Well, here's what we read in Acts chapter 5, beginning at verse 29. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. Ah, thy will be done. We must obey God rather than human beings, they said. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. Obviously, they had not read how to win friends and influence people. They brought home the truth that these are the very people, the people who are telling them not to proclaim Jesus. These are the very people who killed him in the first place, who orchestrated his death. They say, <clears throat> The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Did you hear that? the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. It is the Spirit of God who brings us to faith. It is the Spirit of God who works in our hearts to change us. And as you and I obey the direction of God, his Holy Spirit comes on us in increasing power. The Spirit is given, the book of Acts tells us, and the apostles tell us to those who obey him. We ought to obey God rather than men. That's the way they started. And now they say, when we obey God, he gives supernatural power. Do you realize that was not just simply for apostles in the first century? Do you understand that that promise is not simply intended for people who lived 2000 years ago? Nothing has changed. God does not change. And God gives his spirit to those who believe. And to those who obey, he gives even more. It's why Jesus told us, ask, keep on asking and you will receive. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So often when we want to know God's will, we want it in an instant. We want it just simply laid out real quickly so that we can get on with our old way of life. And what the scripture is saying is we have a new way of life and God is inviting us into his presence and he wants to spend time with us and he wants us to spend time with him. And he gives his Holy Spirit to those who listen to him and he offers, he offers amazing gifts. Once again, in the book of Acts, we see how the Spirit of God directs people, believers, according to his will. Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 6. This is what we read. This is during the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul and, and his dear friend Timothy and other workers. And we read Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. 
When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. You see what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit not only brings to mind the things Jesus has taught, but the Holy Spirit also gives guidance to God's people to carry out God's work. When you and I pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're saying, God, I want you to conquer me because Jesus has given everything for me. I surrender my life to you. And I vow by faith that I will listen to your word. I will search the scriptures. I will grow in my relationship with you. I desire and I will spend time with you in prayer. I will pour out my heart to you. And I will seek, I will seek you with my heart that my will may be aligned with your own. And I will walk in obedience because I know that your Holy Spirit will guide and lead me. And I know that you will answer. You will answer in clear and direct ways the way I should go. Our God is good and he is faithful. And Jesus teaches us to pray boldly. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Your will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. Our desire, God's desire, is to bring heaven down, to work in and through us so that we may experience more and more the power of a transformed life through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus so that the world may see more and more clearly the power of the living God to change and transform and renew And so that the world, the world may come to know him who loves us, gave his son for us all, and who is coming back. Because the day is coming, dear friends, when his will will be done in all fullness on earth as it is in heaven. Because the day is coming when the Lord Jesus will return and every eye will see him. And until that day, we pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, your word is abundantly clear. And it not only speaks to our minds, it convicts our hearts and souls. Lord, I know. And we know how we have failed you on so many occasions, how we have been selfish in our thoughts, thought my will be done and your will be changed. We repent of that. I repent of that. And we come before you in faith saying, Lord Jesus, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray your will be done. Teach us to walk according to your will. Teach us to seek you with our whole heart. Teach us to listen to your Holy Spirit. We pray that prayer, simply asking you, Lord, to conquer us, to take control. And we pray that prayer in confidence that not only will you do that, but you will bring amazing joy and incredible opportunities and abundant peace through faith in Jesus, the crucified and risen Son of God, who is our returning King. Amen. Amen. For discussion, how do you react to these two sentences? I want to want what you want. I want to do what you would do. What, what comes to mind? What, what, is that, uh, what does that bring to the surface in your life? And then secondly, 
Where do you sense God prompting you in regards to knowing his will through the word, through prayer, and through the spirit? I think there's plenty there to get us started. God bless you, dear friends. Look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week. And uh, may the Lord be with you and guide you in these coming days.